Hi, Dr. Tara Egan here. Hello to our audience and thank you for visiting the YouTube page. We are here with Dr. Quincy Gideon and she is going to talk about religious trauma today. So thank you so much for being here. I'm thrilled to be here. Can't wait. Well, we're going to start off. We're going to get into it because I always like to know about the guest background as far as what led you to be interested and passionate about this topic. Well, spoiler alert, I grew up in a very culty environment. (laughs) So this is kind of how it starts. So I grew up in a very, very strict, rigid version of the Southern Baptist Conference Church in the South. And it had a lot of culty beliefs and a lot of really restrictive, um, misogynistic, sometimes racist, definitely homophobic ways of seeing the world. And I was totally, totally enculturated in that. Um, I didn't have a lot of access to outside sources, um, outside of maybe uh, family reunions and things like that. I was really, really involved in this um, group. And so that turns into an adulthood, a young adulthood where I lived by those rules, followed them all, married a man, and then he came out of the closet and, uh, about a year into our marriage and suddenly none of the rules made sense. And this God that I had been told about for so long had betrayed me because I had followed the rules and they didn't work. And that probably started a slow deconstruction process. And in the religious trauma world, um, that term simply means the slow untangling and unraveling of those really tightly held beliefs that you once had and trying to understand where you stand now. And that was, it's usually a long process of a couple of years. And that's probably when mine started. How did your family feel about you um, changing your perspective about the religion you had grown up with? Well, I think that families really kind of manage this in different ways. Mine just simply doesn't talk about it. Um, I am very vocal on social media. All of my extended family follows me there. No one speaks up, but none of them leave either. So sometimes I just sort of wonder if maybe some of it is kind of landing. Some of it is starting to make a little bit of sense to them. Some of my real life experiences that others uh, can't explain away or, uh, spiritually bypass and make good or, uh, give some sort of trope right around like how I'm supposed to feel about it. Um, you know, my experience was rather traumatic back then. And I think that in the face of that, there has been a bit of a humbling acceptance that my path is going to be a bit different, but, I don't want to deceive anyone out there and say that it's easy. There's never a Thanksgiving dinner or a Christmas conversation. There is never, you know, we've got Easter coming up. Um, that is That never goes without some suggestion, hard conversation, tension that we all have to sort of work through together. Wow. Mm-hmm. Oh, this is fascinating. I'm already intrigued. And the thing (laughs) is, I wasn't raised with religion, particularly. And so I don't, a lot of the stuff I know about religion, I either gathered through my first marriage, and I was married to a Catholic and his family's Catholic, or like stereotypes, or some of the um, extreme stories you hear online, or maybe they have like a reality show. I mean, I can't help but think of Welcome to Plathville. Do you know that Mm -hmm. show? Welcome to Plathville, 19 Kids and Counting with the Duggar family. They're a part of a cult. I can talk about that too Mm -hmm. um, today. So yeah, it's a, I think when you see the inner world and you see like how the little girls have to dress and what the gender roles are and Um, who has access to the outside world and how the entire world is seen as like evil and scary and will corrupt you. And uh, it's sort of an inner, um, if you participated in it too much, it would be a vulnerability to your spiritual health, right? Because you will backslide or you will Uh, something bad will happen. Something untoward will happen if you participate in the outside world too much. And so that's one of the things that we look for in religious trauma and cult-like environments is that us versus them mentality. That's the very definition of an extreme belief that we here inside this small little group have 
all of the information that we might need to make a decision. And we are right about it. We are the only ones that are right about it. And everyone else is wrong. That's cult-like thinking. Hmm. Okay. So that's, would you say you've defined religious trauma or is what other pieces are going to be helpful for us to know? Well, religious trauma is anytime you have had a, a trauma in general is something that happens too much, too fast, right. And, or too, or too consistently, and you can't get out of it. So you're kind of helpless in that. And so if you add the religious part of it, it's when something really, really painful, upsetting, uh, dehumanizing happens within an environment that ignores it for the sake of the overall church, the community perception, or, uh, there's some sort of spiritual bypassing that goes on, like, God wanted this to happen, or God will never give you anything that you can't handle, or God wants this. He's teaching us something with this. That's when we drag God into our traumatic experiences. And now the one resource that we were supposed to have, right? When trauma happens is that there's perhaps this loving God or higher power that's there to help us has now been dragged into it. And now it was part of the plan. We deserved this. Um, you know, this trauma was somehow some spiritual test. And that's when things get really tricky. Cause where do you go from there? If your entire community, it's an us versus them, your entire community, God, parents, um, everyone has decided that the trauma that you have been through was somehow part of this overall scheme on behalf of God. Then now everything feels unsafe. Both the outside world that you've been taught about is unsafe. And now the inside world is unsafe too. Where does a person go? We're in that space, you know, when they're in that space. And to me, that's the, that's the undercurrent of religious trauma. Now, can all religions, depending on how that person's experience is on occasion or whatever, be classified as a cult or is it a religion is a, is a, is a cult like this one is, and then maybe this one isn't. And if you're, even if you've experienced trauma within a, a, a religion that is not viewed to be cult-like, like, like I'm not sure I'm making sense. You totally are. And it's a common question. And I think that it's one that we ponder a lot. Um, I will tell you that the first part of the problem is that the word cult has been become a part of the zeitgeist of our world, right? So we have cult favorites in movies and we have a cult following with beauty brands. We, we've overused a word and so it's sort of lost its meaning. And so part of the first problem in the cult research religious trauma world is that we're having to try to figure out a way to really well define what a cult actually is like, what are its features? How do we measure it? Uh, when does it move from this to this, right? From just a religious belief to a cult. And that is all over the map. We're getting better at it. Um, with research, but there, there really are a lot of different experts that will say after decades of experience, they'll say that a cult is one thing. And I totally disagree. <laughs> So that's part of the problem is that we haven't been able to define it really well, but outside of all of that, I will say that I believe that cults happen when a religious belief becomes extreme, it becomes restrictive, it becomes the only way of dealing with something. So all other available resources, including mental health, including doctors, including medical services, when all other outside experts that actually do have some expertise are seen as the enemy. Now we're really in cult environment. And that can happen in a Catholic church that can happen in a little podunky Southern Baptist church. Like I grew up in right? It, it became cult-like because the, the beliefs that were touted by the Southern Baptist convention, which is like the overall governing body. That's like when, a really big governing body, isn't it? Yeah, it I'm is. And it like a big deal religion, not just like some guy in a shed. Right. Right. It's a, it's a big conference that 
has a lot of political power, which I have a problem with. This is when things start getting culty too. Uh, but it also has different, like leaders in different churches can do different things. So when the Southern Baptist Conference touts something like we believe in this, like no dancing. And then dancing becomes like the thing that this church is fighting against, including in schools and communities and whatever, just as an example. Mm -hmm. Now we've moved from a belief that maybe, you know, a convention somewhere far away <laughs> decided was important, but now it has, it is really impacting people's lives through this very extreme belief that is impermeable. Like you can't talk anyone out of it. And it becomes the way that they live and breathe and judge people and who is in, who is out, who is good, who is bad, who is sinful, who is righteous. And that that's when it becomes a problem. Yeah, that's a big problem. Holy <laughs> <laughs> so thinking about why people will gain, I don't know if you would call it awareness or, or, or start to develop a perspective that something is awry in their life and that, that they may need to view the world in, from a different lens. Are there things that tend to trigger that? Like, I can't help but think of, like in your situation, you know, your partner is gay mm -hmm. um, or I think of certain physical abuse or sexual abuse, mm -hmm. whether it's um, an adult abusing a child or within a in marriage or within a relationship. You know, I, as a therapist, do a lot of work with families who are going through divorce. And even mm -hmm. though I would completely refer out if I had, if I was introduced to a family who had religious trauma as a primary um, mm -hmm. concern or referral concern, I do see where there is a divergence between you know, spouses on some sort of belief system, whether it's how to get medical treatment for their child or even like what the role of extended family members is or how who's in charge of money or who has the opportunity to, to expand their career. Like, and it causes so much discord. And usually mm -hmm. it's the woman who's, you know, daring to go outside of the more right. conservative, traditional female role. Right. And it's not received well. And then sometimes the children view that as, as mom's betraying. That's right you know, the, the upgrade, the upbringing that was always supposed to be. Yeah. So drag God into that and say, this is what has been commanded of you. And now you're sinful. And now mom is not just betraying the family. She is a sinner and probably going to hell. And she's going to take you with her. I mean, this, this is whatever the sort of the normal discourse would be the painful discourse of separating a family and co-parenting and trying to figure out what that's going to be like, turn that volume up, turn that heat up <laughs> and you add God to it. And now there's this vague, ominous, dangerous, truly figure out there that will punish you because this group says that you're wrong. And in the, they, you know, they're backed up by the church. They're backed up by the community, the amount of gaslighting and self-doubt and crumbling sense of confidence that happens in this season is really hard to watch, but it, it really is so common. Oh, it hurts my heart. To mm -hmm. about, you know, just the impact on somebody's well-being and mental health in all of those domains. Mm -hmm. And then you have, um, children, of course, involved in that. And so I can't help but think about a child or children going through trauma and whether it's their own experience with um, whomever, you know, their family or religious leader. And, and then I think about, you know, a parent maybe who's trying to break free and has not only their spouse or the community to contend with, but, but potentially the rejection of their own children. Mm -hmm. Right. It's, it's almost insurmountable. I mean, I think that there's kind of questions that come up in religious trauma journeys of, is this worth it? If I lose everyone, is it worth it? Now that is a feature of a cult. If everything is on the line, jobs, resources, finances, marriage, community, children, everything would be taken away from you. If you lose a group or if you walk away from a group, that's a cult. Right. I like to watch those little snippets on YouTube and I couldn't even tell you the name of the channel or anything where they interview people who have left a cult 
Mm -hmm. And oftentimes it's they're a member of the LGBT community, but weren't allowed mm -hmm. to express that. That seems to be a big catalyst on these mm -hmm. in these videos. Um, or they've been physically or sexually abused and couldn't mm -hmm. do it anymore. Yeah, there's usually a couple of different kind of categories of folks that um, off ramp. That's what we call it in the religious trauma or cult world is that we as outsiders want to provide an off ramp for those that are in these very insular communities. So because anytime you say you're in a cult, they're going to dig their heels in, right? You've already lost them. You've already lost the plot here. And so I think that there's a couple of different ways that people leave in general. And of course, there's going to be nuances and, and, and different stories, but sometimes there's a, an identity issue. So sometimes it's the embedded homophobia or it's the embedded racism or the embedded misogyny and, and roles or sexual repression that happen in the group that your basic human, uh, your basic humanity is sort of fighting against, right? Like, what is this? I will never be able to be myself. I keep having these feelings and no amount of prayer is going to make it go away. Like there's kind of these, my, my humanity is pushing against the very rules that I have to follow. And that's typically like one big category. There's also the category of, you know, really specific horrifying pain has happened. Now, whether that's through sexual abuse, whether that's watching some sort of, you know, flagrant abuse of power um, and watching it, but feeling helpless to it. And then that makes you question your sense of trust and certainly your sense of self. Like, did I perceive that correctly? It's a very complicated thing, but usually there, it starts with a very painful event, a trauma that's happened that sort of causes someone to kind of have questions or start the process of disconnecting like millimeter by millimeter. And then I find that there's a third category of people who really do feel connected to the group, feel connected to the theology or the set of beliefs and really don't walk around with a lot of questions about that. But life happens and they somehow, usually by accident, come in contact with someone that's outside of the group and they have an incredibly kind, sweet, soft human moment. And that starts to cause some like eating questions, right? So we, we talk a lot about some groups that um, can't. Uh, interact with outsiders in certain ways. There's lots of Christian kind of offshoots that do this, lots of Mormon offshoots that do this. And, um, you know, there'll be these stories of like, but there was this kind woman that stopped on the side of the road and helped me change a tire, you know, cause I wasn't allowed to have a cell phone and I wasn't allowed to have contact with the outside world. And she wouldn't have known that. And she stopped anyway to like help me. And we had a conversation and it had nothing to do with beliefs, but she was talking about getting together with her girlfriends later tonight. And it's, it was like, Oh, oh. Yeah, oh, you can do that. And it's not sort of built into this, like highly structured judged, um, right way, rigid way of doing things. One time, this was like a million years ago, when I was married to my first husband, I lived in this neighborhood and there was a, another mother, kids the same age, who was very, very spiritual, very religious, very involved with her church. And we had had a discussion once because I work with kids and oftentimes the kids I work with struggle with behavioral issues. And she had been talking about how much screaming and yelling she did before they went to church on Sunday. And so I, you know, she kind of asked my thoughts on it and I suggested several ideas of how to make the morning go smoother. And one of them was, you know, it may be that you are late or it could be that you don't go that day because they are, it's, you know, it, it wouldn't occur to them that like this privilege, because the kids liked it. They had a whole mm -hmm. Sunday school group, like that they haven't earned the privilege to go. And she was like, so offended that I would have suggested not going to church, which I certainly had no intention mm -hmm. to to be offensive. And so she, after that, she was kind of cold towards me. Then like a f bunch of months go by and we're at this neighbor's house at a Christmas party. And we're at the Christmas party and she's standing talking to someone like right near me. And I'm talking to someone different. But she overhears this conversation where we're talking about like our children and like just to me, it felt like a, a really regular conversation, but I guess I don't remember it great, but I guess the mother was saying something that was 
painful to her or something. And I just was a good listener and very empathic. And so she, the, the woman I was speaking to walks away and this mother says, you know, you really are a good person, even though you don't go to church. And I had I had maybe a glass of wine. I'm not much of a drinker. It took enough to be like, oh, okay. And then like later on, and I was like, wait, there's like a doubt I'm a good person? Mm -hmm. Like, how is that oh, yeah. panned out? Like, I just had never had a thought that someone could base whether or not I was a good person on whether or not I went to their church or a mm -hmm. church that was similar. But I was like, like the next day or a couple of days later, and then I was like, kind of offended that like, mm -hmm. oh, I didn't know my, my goodness. Mm -hmm. I didn't know my goodness was up to for debate. So that, and that was a, just a small moment, but it was something, but she was like, after that, I feel like she looked at me in new eyes to see that I could be kind and empathic or whatever to this woman who was fretting about her family or something. And I don't know. So eye opening. I think what you're describing is so common. And so to, to think about it from your perspective that you might not even know that she walks around the world feeling like everyone is dangerous if they don't go to her church. Now, just imagine if that church is like a couple of hundred people, those, those are the only people in the whole wide world that have it right. Mm -hmm. Like what an odd, upsetting, you know, fearsome way to experience the world. Um, but then also that you didn't know that, that, that she was walking around like that. And that she is literally quivering most of the time with anxiety about who is safe, who is not, um, you know, she's been given some rules to follow. And if she can do that, well, there's lots of promises of eternal life in heaven or a uh, connection with God. I mean, these are really big promises based on rules that no one could upkeep all of the time and remain healthy. Mm. Wow. What a bind. So I want to tell you, here's the story I was. Okay. I'm ready earlier. Okay. So not raised re religious, not told anything particularly bad about it, but not told anything particularly good, just kind of neutral. So I marry somebody who's from, you know, that Roman Catholic background to me, from my perspective, it looked like they phoned it in. They went every Sunday, um, did the Easter and the Christmas celebrations, but they didn't talk about God. They didn't have a Bible on a bookshelf. You could see there was there was that, you know, um, prayer that you say before dinner, but it's the same one every time and it's just kind of muttered and then you start passing the food. So to me, it was like just like a thing they did that, you know, you, you do just do on Sundays. But they just didn't seem to live it. It doesn't mean they were doing anything like bad, but it just didn't seem like a central part of their experience was this religion. So we get married and my spouse wants to get married in the Catholic church. And I was like, that's fine. I'm not Catholic, but as long as they're cool with it, you know, like I'm cool with it. So I had to get some, you know, special permission or whatever. Um, I would you cover your shoulders. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and so, but they, they tried to talk me into becoming Catholic. And I was like, I'm not informed enough to do that. Like that would just be me saying yes to something I don't really understand. Um, so I declined that. So we did the wedding and um, we're married. And in all 10 years of our married life, the only time we went to church was when we went to visit his parents. And we tried a couple times other other times to get to know a church, especially when we moved to the South, because I was like, oh, this will be a great way for us to meet people. And, um, but it just was so restrictive mm -hmm. for me mm -hmm. as somebody. So then we go and we get, to, we're getting divorced. And so my spouse says that he wants an annulment. And I was like, how does that work? Like we've been together 15 years. We lived together for three years before we were married. Then we've been married 10 years. We have two kids. Like we're pretty traditional as far mm -hmm. as like what married life looks like. So then there was this huge campaign where he started questioning like my mental health to try to say that I had that I hadn't let me just think that I hadn't been in a mentally well enough space to consent to the marriage. So like we weren't actually married. And then he said that because I was so controlling, he felt forced into the marriage. So it was like he wasn't able to give consent. And then he like 
I had to go to Charleston and I opposed it. I was like, you're not going to make our marriage never mm. have existed. Like I might not be super religious, but like our marriage existed legally, mm -hmm. spiritually. We have mm -hmm. two children. So I like appealed it. And so I had to go down to Charleston and there was like several people in the room and then we like had to t t basically say our case and then they had a counselor there. So this is a mental health clinician, which is what I am, mm -hmm. who weighed in on it. Okay. So then she wrote her perspective about the validity of our marriage. So this is like we're both like super mainstream normal people. Like, <laughs> yeah. I, you know, like there's there's not like yeah. Well, there was a another person in our marriage, or right. there was that time I was in a psych hospital for right. six months or something like like just whatever. So we go and so I talk to them. You know, I feel like we're both coherent. This is just a conversation. So then I get the whatever their response back and they rejected it because of me being unfit somehow to, but the mental health therapist, I looked her up and she was an eating disorder specialist, which like, I don't have an eating disorder, never have, wasn't written in any of the paperwork. Like she was a therapist who, from my view, as a therapist, didn't have the credentials to weigh in on my mental health after a single interview for about an hour in this church with other re religious officiants. And that was it. Nor and so I, I appealed to Rome. I sent in $1,000 and they rejected it too. So we, so after being married for all that, that time and having two kids and like, they said that our marriage was invalid. And so... <laughs> And do you feel like he was, um, like the rules of the Catholic church of like annulment has to happen in order for a legitimate second marriage. Do you feel like that played a role in yes. his desire to do it? Okay. Yeah. So, so this is a wonderful example of things being touted as like letter of the law. Like you have to follow these things that by the letter of the law in order for blessings or whatever, but when it gets down to it they've made rules that are impossible for people to truly live by. And so despite what you were going to do, or despite what you were saying, there was going that the entire church was moving against you in that way, because he was a part of them and you weren't, and they have created a rule gonna... that he can't get around unless they grant it. Right. Well, and he had, re, you know, he remarried, we were legally divorced and then the annulment was granted well after our divorce. And so he had legally remarried someone else, had a child. And then because it, it takes, you know, like two years or something mm -hmm. to get the response from Rome. And then I don't know what happened after that. Like, I don't know what what they did as far as the church or not. It's none of my business. But I just and then when we were going through a couple of years later, some kind of, like we were adjusting our custody agreement and it kind of came up again because he was using this evidence of me just kind of being spiteful and mean. I've never been able to articulate, and I'm a pretty articulate person, why that mattered to me. Like when mm. I'm not religious, I'm not Catholic, I wasn't raised that way. The f Like he, he just couldn't understand, like, why does this matter to you? Mm. Like you're not even religious. And I was just like, it's not – if you said our marriage was valid, but I'd like to have – be annulled due to spiritual differences or something, or or even due to me not being a member of the sh church, I can get behind that. But it was actually my understanding of it was that our marriage like didn't exist yeah. in the eyes of the church. And I was like, we have two children who you're, you're supposedly insisting that you're going to raise Catholic, but mm -hmm. you're going to tell them that their that your your relationship with their mother. Mm -hmm. was like, I don't know, under some sort of duress or something like they're not idiots. Like, clearly, that's not the case. Yeah, I think you were probably you had a, I think, probably clear outside view. Uh, and, and that was, I think, probably the thing that like kept you coming back to it. There was, I imagine that there was something kind of running through this that you knew was based on a lot of rules that change when they're convenient to people. Yes. And that is a beautiful picture of how religious trauma plays out.
Well, it was there's so these much rules. Lying. It was the stuff that was written in this long complaint was stuff like that didn't happen or was twisted. Like my mother growing up struggled with mental illness. So he was using the fact that I had a a parent with mental illness as well. And of course, Tara was mentally ill, even though there was no like evidence. And like their evidence was the fact that their evidence of me being mentally ill was the fact that my mother had a mental illness, which is crazy. But then on top of that, there's a therapist who has credentials in the secular world who is coming into a religious entity and backing that up and like signing her name to things. And like, at the time, I didn't know what to do. Now, I think if that happened today, I would report that person to the board. Yeah, same. I didn't then I've looked up her name, like, like, I would have to find the paperwork. But like, I used to know her name, like, I used to just remember it. Um, And I recently I was like, oh, this just hits me so wrong because mm-hmm. I feel also so betrayed by a member who should be in my clan. You right. Know? Like, yeah. Right. Like I don't have a religion, but like I have right. all of these colleagues that I just admire right. so much of what they do. And to have one of them turn on me, like the whole, it was like on many levels, extremely distressing. I can imagine. And I mean, it's a beautiful picture of gaslighting too, around like, you're crazy, you're crazy, you're crazy. And then whatever you do in response to the, I'm not crazy. And I I'm going to prove it to you. I am not crazy. They use that as evidence that you are quote crazy. I mean, it is, it's crazy making, um, no pun intended. And and, And it was like, like, I think they said something like, because I was so calm and articulate, like that meant I didn't care that much. But I mean, imagine if I had gone in there and been like, oh, you need help me. Mm-hmm. Like, that would have been crazy. There's, there's yeah, you no were in a no winning. win. That No, yeah, there, you were in a bind. And that is what happens in these rigid religious groups is that there's a rule. You have to follow this rule. No one is the exception to this rule. And then it turns out that doesn't play well in real life. Right. It didn't play well that an annulment was required after a 15 year relationship that doesn't play well when it actually is applied to human beings. And so what does the entity have to do in order to protect their own? They have to change it or they have to make the outsider look crazy. And this happens all the time. It just seems I felt so hurtful to my to my children, too, Mm -hmm. that that I wouldn't be like acknowledged as a legitimate wife you know, after all that we hit, cause we had like a great marriage for a long time and then mm-hmm. we didn't, you know? And so it's, you know, to, for it to be like, no, delete, delete, we're done here. Mm-hmm. Like, I just found that so hurtful. And I know that compared to, cause I'm not wounded by like, oh, the Catholic people don't like me. Like, I don't have that sense mm-hmm. of, uh, I don't know. I imagine there's, there's more like a, a sense of missing that group or missing the connection. Like I was never connected to Catholicism. It wasn't like Mm -hmm. Catholicism. I honestly think it hurt me that my ex-husband wanted to delete our relationship, but then also that mental health therapist Mm -hmm. for me, that felt like a huge betrayal. Um, But then I married again and I married someone who grew up in the Greek Orthodox church. Right. Yeah. He is not like that. (laughs) <laughs> and he is not, he doesn't, I, I wouldn't consider him t- to be very practicing or whatever, mm-hmm. but he was like the altar boy. And like, you know, um, I mean the, the, like one funeral thing I've gone to is filled with rituals, you mm-hmm. know, and he just like stepped away and lives his life. And, you know, he's been divorced and he didn't get an old or anything like that. And it's so refreshing. And I think, well, if anybody you think, would have a more rigid perspective. This Greek Orthodox, you know, many of the members like were born in Greece and came here and Mm -hmm. things like that. And I don't know, thankfully I did not repeat that mistake. So that's my story. Well, I think you're highlighting too, what happens when um, people are, they're not believed because like you have two men that have a similar ish high church ritualistic background, right. In their religious practices. And yet they experience them differently enough that one literally had to go through all of these things, call you crazy, uh, pull in the church, blah, blah, blah. And one 
didn't have to do that, right? Really, truly, if we got down to the brass tacks, there's probably more similarities than there were differences in the ways in which they experienced church along the way, but people do different things with it. And this is, I think, you know, a plea (laughs) to those that are in the church and they're listening to something like this and they're going, well, I've never seen that. And that's never happened to me. And my pastor has never said that maybe, and there's things that go on behind closed doors that you don't know about. There's dynamics that become really abusive. If anyone is just a little bit (laughs) honorary about the belief system and you could grow up in a very similar church and have a totally different experience based on the Bible study leader, your parents at home, the, the ways in which those rigid rules from their church were translated into your daily life, right? Like how, how much was that kept? Um, how fearful were your parents about your, you know, backslidden sinful nature? I mean, it, it really, you can, you can truly be in a very similar space and have totally different experiences. So it's really important to believe those that have had really bad ones because they're hurting. I wonder if that's why my, my husband is so open-minded is because when he became, you know, was transitioning between teenagerhood and adulthood And like, you know, being from the Greek culture, it was like, you know, arranged marriages. And there was, you know, if you were going to date what they called an American, which is, you know, anyone not Greek, then, um, you know, like that was just terrible. And he, you know, told us not to, I don't want to tell his story too much about like the, um, I don't know what you call their leaders, pastors, maybe, or whatever, um, like came and parked his car and blocked my husband's car in the driveway because he had told his mom, I believe in college that he was going to go on a date with somebody not Greek. Mm -hmm. And so like he, I know he had things like that happen that didn't feel tolerable to him, Mm -hmm. you know, and he would never have treated his children Mm -hmm. in a similar manner, but maybe because he did have some of those moments himself, you know, it, it caused him to, by the time I came along, you know, cause we have been married seven years. I'm 45. Um, maybe he had gone through so much of that journey. And so we ended up in a very similar place and then we could be together, but maybe had I met him when he was 18 or 23, it wouldn't have been possible. Yeah. There's so many factors, right? Like time of life experience, how that experience turns into insight or not. Um, the social support that you have. I mean, it, it really does it matters. All of these different factors really do play a part in the overall gestalt. So what do you do? What do you do if you're listening to this episode and you think, Ooh, this could be me or this could be my sister or my best friend. Like what happens then? Well, there's really kind of three steps to this. And, um, I actually, I have a membership for people that are getting out of religious trauma and cults, um, because this is something that sometimes you just need like a little bit of, you need someone else to provide the education (laughs) because you're a little overwhelmed. The number one, there's kind of three big symptoms. There's a lot of symptoms that happen, but there's very like three really big ones. Overwhelm folks that are getting out of religious trauma and cults, they feel um, like they've been lied to most of the time, like their whole life is based on some lie and, and they don't know, like it's suddenly grocery shopping is hard, right? Because everything that they have grown up with is now turned on its head um, or potentially turned on its head. Um, And there's a lot of guilt and shame a lot of guilt and shame and a lot of anxiety that you're wrong and that you will actually end up in hell. And this is the devil or whatever untoward force trying to convince you and take you away from the group because the group teaches that. Right. So this is kind of the abusive woman deciding whether or not to leave her husband. Like, am I doing the right thing? Am I crazy? Maybe he's not that bad. That's right. Maybe if I leave, I can't support myself. He always says I'm a loser. You know, Mm -hmm. if he takes the kids and are the kids going to blame me? I mean, Mm -hmm. it just reminds me of that narrative that I hear so often with the families that I work with. Yeah. You just pick it up and put it inside of a a religious or a culty group. And then suddenly the same rules apply. So given those three really big things that typically are 
the, um, they're the thing that prevents people from getting out of these groups sooner rather than later. Um, the anxiety, the guilt and shame, the overwhelm. Um, we really have to take those things seriously first. Otherwise you're gonna keep going back to the abusive group. And so in that, um, there's usually kind of three different categories of things that you gotta do. <laughs> You've gotta educate yourself. And that is usually needs to be a slow drip of information about what happened to you. In my opinion, if you're ready to tolerate it, there is an abundance of psychological theory that can really explain pretty well what happened to you. And so that's why I sort of put on that psychologist hat and teach people in this membership based on like, hi, here's a cognitive bias. And it was used against you all the time. And here's a logical fallacy. And it is built into, it is baked into the very thing that you learned. Here's deconstruction. Here's the seven features of a cult group. Which of these like played out with you? Here's what narcissistic leaders do. Here's how it plays out. Here's how it would, you would take narcissistic leadership to pick it up out of your pastoral ship and you would add it to a family. Now you've got a cult that you're part of and a cult of one when dad's a narcissist or mom's a narcissist, right? So I'm sort of teaching them along the way how psychology has a lot to offer to try to explain what happened to them so that they can make you know, educated choices about how they continue, where their boundaries are, what they want their children to be involved in, what they can tolerate at a Christmas dinner table, how they have those conversations first before the dinner starts. <laughs> Gosh, <laughs> to just boundaries, sort of... boundaries, boundaries. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's a lot of boundary work. So education and usually a slow drip of education support tends to be the thing that is the, the biggest mitigating factor with any trauma. And the same holds true in religious trauma is that you need people that are either ahead of you in the game, right where you are, or they just started because that is a wonderful, wonderful reminder of how far you've come on those days that you feel like I'm never going to get out of this. I'm never going to not feel anxious. I'm always going to worry about what my mom or dad or group are thinking or saying about me. So support ends up being a huge part of that. And then boundaries and boundaries can only happen with insight when it comes to religious trauma and cult abuse. So I, you and I could teach all day long, like a whole day of boundaries. Yeah. It would be practical when they say this, you say this, when this happens, you do this. Here's what the text messages look, need to look like. Here's what you say in response. Let's practice. We could do that. And it falls right on its face when someone drags God into it. And this, this old feeling gets churned up that you are doing something wrong by being boundaried with the very people that talk to God more than you do or have more access to God than you do. So what we build into the membership, what we, what I do in therapy is really try to help people understand that you've got to know what happened to you. Not what happens in cults in general. That's what we do with this education mm -hmm. thing. But what specifically happened to you? And how did that change how you saw marriage, how you saw sex, how you saw raising children, how you saw emotions, how you saw anger, right? Like there's all of these different things that play out in everyday life that are so baked in <laughs> to the theology that you learned that you've really got to, to take all of this psychoeducation that you're receiving and understand what happened to you very specifically. And when you get a really good handle on that boundaries are very easy They you don't have to, you don't have to like rake yourself over the coals for them because now they make sense based on what you know about your own experience. Well, I think about that too, with the, the women I work with where they tend to be pulled into like, well, if you were a good mother, you would insert, have my kids spend time with an abusive dad you know, not leave the marital home, you know, whatever, mm -hmm. insert whatever. Mm -hmm. And so I think I see so many ways that the work you do and the work I do intersect, which I came sure. into this conversation with like, I have no idea what you do. Mm -hmm. And then I see how much, you know, it, 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 it interacts or intersects with the work that I do. Now, how do people 
like, is it possible that if you were raised in a cult like, you know, environment, are these people who end up having to step away from organized religion completely to, to be free? Or, or do they find a way to get to a, a more happy, healthier medium where they still have the, the, the parts of the religion that gives them comfort mm -hmm. and structure, but doesn't have the abuse part of it? Well, I am pretty pithy in this because most Christians in that specific religion believe that there's only one way to heaven. And one of the things that I say often in my membership and in our monthly Q and A's where I'm like trying to help people kind of understand specifics, what is, what has happened to them? They will hear me say a lot. There are many paths to heaven. <laughs> and I say the same here is that there are an infinite number of ways that anyone could approach this there, there could be seasons where you are more involved and then you have to pull back. There could be a complete pullback. There could be a complete pullback and then a slow sort of rejoining. Um, once you find a safe community that maybe doesn't do these things, I think that you really just have to pay attention to what is it important to you to overcome the triggers and by, and in that, I mean, exposing yourself near constantly in a new environment that perhaps is safer, you are going to have a higher level of exposure than those that walk away just completely. And you got to know that, and you got to be prepared for that. And you got to know that for a while, that's really going to be detrimental to your mental health and that's okay. Like we can get through that. There's nothing, you know, triggers aren't the end all be all, but you just have to know that there is going to be a hard season ahead of showing back up to a, to an environment that is going to sound a lot like, um, some of the, the abusive things that you heard, even if they aren't abusive now. So you just have to sort of be prepared for that. I do think that those that are in, you know, religious environments that are safe and are supportive, they tend to have overall better mental health. Mm -hmm. I'm just concerned about what that line is between, you know, when something becomes supportive and when it becomes um, insular and no one can come in and out, right? Like at what point does that start? And some groups are very healthy for a very long time. Think about Synanon. It, it was a really great uh, heroin um, recovery space. And then it changed. And it's one of the, the worst child abuse um, cults out there. So, you know, when did that change and when did that line happen and who was there to stop it? So I, I just think that there's lots to consider here, but I think anyone can do it any way that they want. Okay. Well, it's nice to hear that there's people who've been able to navigate that. Cause if I were listening to this podcast and I looked at it as an all or nothing, literally all or nothing, it could be really, really hard to imagine. Mm -hmm. And so, but to be able to say, okay, there's people out there who've been able to reconcile, you know, t the two, the two worlds and find a way that it works for them. And even though it might be a really hard journey, you know, and so, and yeah. I've heard of people who might have a lot of family rejection, like my grandparents don't speak to me or my dad doesn't, but my mom will come and have lunch with me or my mm -hmm. sister will have me come over the day after Christmas or something mm -hmm. like that, where there's some connections that are still maintained, even mm -hmm. if the world, their world looks very, very, very different. Yeah. I'll kind of share two things here. Number one on our podcast, we are uh, the second season. We're interviewing some pastors that have been through this process of religious trauma, but they are still a part of these churches. Mm -hmm. And we're talking with them a lot about how they're navigating that, right? Their own mental health in the midst of, you know, in some ways I supported the very abuse that was happening because I, my paycheck depended on it and I was scared. And I was also told that this is what God wanted by up, upper leadership. And then also how do I reconcile that? How do I, you know, pay attention to my guilt and shame and do something with that that's helpful. So there are people that are not only like, do I attend, <laughs> but are actually still in some leadership position. And I actually think they're going to change the world. I, I think that they are in the most powerful position to really pay attention to what the lived experience of religion can be and, and the not so pretty sides of it. And then what we as humans need to be doing in order to create safety 
and support in the very spaces that purport that from the very beginning, right? That's what churches say. We are safe and we are supportive, but in actuality, there's not many that actually are. And so that's, that really has to change. And then I will say that anecdotally, my own experience of coming out of my religious trauma and deconstructing is that I have really found that if I'm just my normal self, that there's a softening with my family. Like I'm still the jokester. I'm still, you know, the one that gives my brother a hard time about something. I'm still the one that anyone can call and we can chat, you know, about whatever and whenever, and it's, it's fun and we'll laugh and we'll, you know, whatever I was that way when I was religious and I am that way now. And so maybe the, maybe the jokes have changed. Maybe, um, you know, I am not as stiff. Maybe I'm a little bit more free, but there is some essential part of me that still exists. And I feel like every time my very religious family sees that there's a bit of a like, huh, like, oh, that's possible. Like she can still be a person. person, Even though you don't go to church. I've heard that before. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. But to see it in their face and to see kind of like the change and the eyebrow raise and the, huh, like the, the, the thing that kind of shifts inside of them as they're asking themselves the question, because they are a part of a church that says like, there's one way to heaven and I, I'm not going according to them right? Because I don't live by the rules and I'm sure that they live in constant fear about that. Right. And so I have some compassion, but then when they show up and they see me and I'm joyful and I have a wonderful life that is full of the same struggles that it had before the church didn't save me from, from any of those, right. They're the same, um, you know, cause life happens. I, I don't know. There's, there's a bit of a shift there that I have noticed. And I, it really means a lot to me that I can see them not argue with me about it, but just sort of like have a moment of like, Oh, hmm, hmm, something to think about. Well, that's to their credit that they certainly have their love for you be stronger than, you know, their fears. Mm -hmm. And so, um, I know for me, I feel very cynical when it comes to, to religion after that, my experience, which is like, I'm sure so mild compared to, to so many people, but I just, when I go into a Catholic church or, or I, or I'm invited to be part of one of the sacraments my kids go through. And of course, you know, I, I, my children know that I'm weary, you know, they know mm-hmm. that like, mm, you know, it, you got to use your critical thinking. You can't mm-hmm. accept everything to be as truth just because somebody in, in, in a collar says it. Or, you know, even even a, a, a parent says it, like you have to be discerning and mm-hmm. you have to recognize that there should be a place for all people in our society, whether it's a religious community or just our, our, our regular community. So that, I know they, I, they're aware of that, um, but I also really want them to develop whatever relationship feels personal and appropriate for them. Like, I, right. I don't want them to feel like I'm going to be disrespectful of something, a belief system they adopt. I just right. want it to be adopted in a way that's healthy. Right. But sometimes when I go into a church and I hear the things that people say as they're standing in the lobby or, um, you know, the what's said versus what's done does not match up. Yeah. I just, I feel very cynical about it all. Yeah. That's one of the stages of deconstruction that people have to go through when they're leaving these spaces and trying to figure out how they, how they move forward. They have to ask themselves the question of like, you know, you have to, can you pay attention to the cognitive dissonance that you've lived in for so long, where the things that you purported were very different than the way the lived experience, um, the things that you believe to be true, don't actually play out very often in real life. And at least not that we can see. So now we have to make up stories. Now we have to make up fantasies. Now there's, you know, lots of, of things that we have to do in order to make that tolerable. And we have to look back at our lives and be like, how much of my life was spent there? Hmm. Good point. Yeah. This is so interesting. I could talk about this all day. You have to be (laughs) mindful of your time. I feel like I've already learned so much. Um, Any last thoughts you want to make sure our audience is left with today? I, 
yeah, two things. If you're in this group and anything, you know, in a group that is culty and restrictive and rigid and your humanity is sort of squashed um, every single day, there are ways out and you can do it privately. And that's a huge fear of so many people. So reach out, we'll find a way to do that for you. And then for those that are um, out uh, or, or don't believe that they're in anything that's culty, my, oh goodness, did you see that? Yeah, it was kind of, <laughs> I could hear you. I never stopped hearing you, but you. I don't know what's happening. Now you're like closer to the camera than you are. It's okay. We can edit it. <laughs> so okay. you said, and for those of you who don't believe they're in a mm. cult, so start there. Okay. So for those of you that don't believe that you're in a cult and, um, really want to fight or become defensive about some of the points that we've made today, um, I just ask for a 20 second pause before you respond to anything that happens or any, anything that anyone tells you. And just imagine that if that had been your experience, what it might've been like for you. So we're just trying to pause, trying to give people some space to heal. This is not easy work. Certainly. You have a hard job and I'm glad that there's people out there like you to do this. And I really, really appreciate your time today because like I said, there was no way I was going to be able to talk about this on my own. I needed an expert. <laughs> <laughs> it's my pleasure. I, this does not, after all of these years, this does not actually feel very taxing for me. And I hope that that's, um, that's encouraging for those that are in it, that there is another side and it, it it's not something that, you know makes you feel crazy every single day. There's a lot of peace on this side of things. So, wow. Well, that's a great yeah. way to end a great note to end on. Now I want to remind our audience that, that our speaker today is Dr. Quincy Gideon and Quincy is spelled Q U I N C E E. Yes. So, <laughs> I do want you to get that right. So if you yes. go Google her, you're not putting a Y in there. So yes. Yeah. Um, two E's at the end. And I'm on Instagram at Dr. Quincy two E's at the end too. So. Okay, perfect. And for those of you who want to even know more about this topic, visit her podcast called Multiple Sources. She's working on season two. Mm -hmm. So do you have a release date for season two or not yet? We don't. We are we are in the trenches right now <laughs> with all of our interviews. We're, we're um, attempting to kind of manage this overwhelm that many religious trauma folks experience by telling really impactful stories that might land in people from a lot of different perspectives. So just a little bit more production behind the scenes in order to make that happen. <laughs> well, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> We are fortunate enough to be in season five of One Day You'll Thank Me. And so you are part of one of our beginning episodes for season five. So I think that people are going to listen to this. And even if it doesn't feel super relevant, it's just super interesting, you know, yeah. just to think about a world that may not be something you're part of, but to right. know that there's people out there experiencing this. And it makes you open your eyes and look a little bit harder at things that you might just have walked on by before. So. Yeah, well, it's my pleasure. I could talk about this stuff all day long. So thanks for having me. Oh, you're very welcome. Well, for our audience out there who's tuned in today, I appreciate you. I appreciate your time. <clears throat> and make sure that you stay tuned as we get as we make our way through season five. We got a lot of really great guests. I normally Quincy have a co host who is my teenage daughter. Anna. Love and this. Yes. So she is not with us today because she is at school. <laughs> Although I think she would be very interested, but I have to be honest, I wouldn't have told that story mm -hmm. if she were here. Cause I don't mm -hmm. think she's going to listen to this episode because the one she's not on, she only listens to them. Um, if I'm like, Oh, listen to this one. So I just <laughs> probably won't mention this episode because I'm pretty careful to not. Um, but I just felt like I felt like I'd share. So I felt in called to do so and we'll just leave her out of it. So, yeah, I'm glad you did. I think that probably landed in people in a way that they needed to hear. Well, good. Well, good. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for being here. And thank you, Dr. Gideon. My pleasure.